listeners. Um, we're on to chapter three of A Mighty Long Way by Carlotta Walls Lanier, titled Birth of a Tiger. But before I begin reading, let's go ahead and take a look at the homework questions. So chapter three runs from pages 44 through 62. You're going to want to write the gist of what you read. Then you're going to answer this question here for Carlotta. What is the significance of knowing Mr. and Mr. Bates? Mr. and Mrs. Bates, I'm sorry. You can highlight um, details about this couple as you are listening to the reading. And the last question says to reread pages 57 through 60. What concerns did some organizations in Little Rock have about desegregating Central High School? How did those concerns affect Carlotta and the Little Rock Nine? So you might want to highlight the concerns of some of these organizations in Little Rock. And we're going to go ahead with chapter three, Birth of a Tiger. By the spring of 1957, my days at Dunbar World were winding down. My ninth grade year was almost over and high school was just around the corner. The idea of going to the brand new Horace Mann had grown on me. I looked forward to moving with my friends there. Just the idea of attending a school where everything was new, the building, the classrooms, the labs, the lockers was exciting. Then one day before the end of the school year, I was sitting in my homeroom class when the teacher made an announcement. Central High School will be integrating in the fall. If our homes fell within certain border streets and we were interested in attending, we should sign the sheet of paper circulating around the room. Three years after the U.S. Supreme Court had ordered schools to integrate, it was really about to happen in Little Rock but you wouldn't have known that there was anything special about this moment. No one asked a question. No one offered a comment. No one passed notes or even whispered to one another. If there was any excitement, uncertainty, nervousness, or fear in the room, none of my peers or our teacher expressed it. The announcement was treated as just another administrative task. It caught my attention, though. My address put me in Central's attendance zone, so I had a quick decision to make. My mind weighed the option. Central High, that grand building looming in the distance as I walked to school practically every day now, would open its doors to me. I'd heard so much about it. I knew I could get into Philander Smith or Arkansas A.M. In the end, but I couldn't help wondering how much wider my options for college would be if I attended Central and suddenly had all of its resources available to me. Plus, Central had competitive athletic teams, and it was just a mile from my home, much closer than man. My decision was made. When the sign up sheet got to me, I eagerly wrote down my name. There were other names on the list, but it didn't occur to me to note who they were. When I made it home from school that afternoon, I didn't even mention my decision to my parents. It wasn't a calculated choice to keep the news from them, but it just never came up. I know that sounds strange, but I've always been independent. I also tend not to make a big deal of things, even at times when something really is a big deal. In my mind, I had done what my parents would have expected. They had told me all of my life that a Good education was paramount and that I should always strive for better. I'm going to go ahead and increase this screen here. Okay. Central clearly seemed the better choice for me, so my decision didn't stick out in my mind as one that needed much discussion. I must say, though, I was also just naive. I thought I had made a simple decision to go to a different school. I had no idea how much my life and the lives of those closest to me were about to change. This is a very good piece of um, evidence here. Let me go ahead and highlight, underline this in red. We're always thinking about the incidents in Carlotta's life that helped to change uh, who she is or what helped to shape her story. And here she says, she just thought she was going to a different school. She had no idea how much her life was getting ready to change. 
Okay, that's very good there. Always make sure you're annotating along the way. As the school year ended, my thoughts were consumed with playing, uh, with playing my summer, planning my summer. I knew the Brooklyn Dodgers would play the Cardinals and that my family would drive to St. Louis for the game. I wondered how many Arkansas Travelers minor league games I'd get to see and which inward league teams would come to town. I knew we at least catch all of the big games on the radio. By then, Daddy also had bought our first television so that we could see some of the games too. First television in 1957, that's pretty paramount, I would say, class. These were good financial times, Carlotta says. Construction, I'm sorry, construction jobs were plentiful. And for several years, Daddy had been earning enough money to splurge on a few luxuries, like the TV. He also was putting the finishing touchings on a new wing he had added onto the back of the house. The renovation started at the old kitchen, which he widened and opened into a new den. A door from the den led into a large master bedroom with an entire wall divided into his and her closets. My parents needed the extra space for the expansive wardrobes. The room was spacious and bright, with lots of light streaming in from a pair of horizontal windows close to the ceiling. Among my favorite features of the room were its light oak hardwood floors, which I had helped Daddy lay. Daddy taught me lots of practical skills, including some tasks that fathers of my generation were more likely to teach their sons. I helped out when he mowed the yard and trimmed the bushes. He would even have me watch while he changed a tire on the car. Mrs. Fox, our neighbor, didn't drive, so when Daddy drove her to the grocery store, he taught me how to shop. You don't just pick up any jar of olives, he would say. Sometimes you want this brand or that one. Sometimes quality matters more than price. When he worked in Big Daddy's Cafe, I was his gopher, setting up tables and delivering orders to the cook. He taught me how to make chili mac. Ooh, that sounds delicious, class. We might have to make this for class tasting. Listen to this. Carlotta's father taught her how to make chili mac, homemade chili with macaroni or spaghetti added. One of the mainstays at the cafe. And when he worked the cash register, I sat on a high stool while he showed me again and again how to count money and give change to customers quickly. I was just 13 when he first taught me to drive. He and I would hop into his truck and head to a deserted back road somewhere in town. Then he'd hand over the wheel. Daddy was a patient and diligent teacher, always had been. I was barely past the toddler stage when he began waking me up at 5 a.m. before he went to work to go over my ABCs and numbers. I'd roll my red wagon full of ABC blocks to him and dutifully recite my alphabet and numbers. The house would be as still as the dawn with just Daddy and me puttering around. When it was time for him to go to work, he kissed me on the cheek and head with his metal lunchbox out the door. My teenage friends were crazy about daddy too, especially the guys, some of whom found it difficult to communicate with their own fathers, who tended to be more rigid and stern. Herbert, one of the regulars in our neighborhood softball games, once told me that he always enjoyed talking to my father. He said that daddy was playful and down to earth, that daddy really listened and never talked down to him. Daddy had a big soft spot in his heart for his daughters. Mother did too. Nothing revealed that more than when the two of them decided during the summer to give their dream bedroom to me. They had even moved in. They hadn't even moved in yet when they surprised me with the news. Now that I was going to high school, they told me I would need a quiet place to study. I could hardly believe my ears for the first time in my life I had a room of my own. I knew how my parents wanted and needed a bigger bedroom, but they were willing to wait at least a few more years until I left for college. Their sacrifice and generosity spoke eloquently to me about what they considered important. My education far meant far more to them 
than their own desire for comfort. I'm going to highlight this too, class, because again, this speaks to what Carlotta values most, okay? Not only does her family mean a lot to her, but so does education. We're always annotating for details that speak to uh, what helped to shape Carlotta's story. Let's keep going. When it came to taste and style, my parents were two of a kind. They didn't have much, but whenever they pulled themselves together for a night on the town, they looked like a million bucks. Their daddy in his Italian design hat, dress suit and shoes, and mother in something flowy with glittery jewels around her neck. There was nothing pretentious or haughty about mother. Daddy just loved sp spoiling her, and whatever mother wanted, from him, she generally got. She didn't believe in buying things on credit, so he often worked two or three jobs at a time, whatever it took to provide for her family. His family was his pride. You can see it all over his face, especially when he stepped out with his glamorous wife on his arm. Class, remember on page 176 are images of Carlotta's family and all of the people who played a very significant role in her life in the integration of Little Rock Central High School. So she said her parents were beautiful every time they went out on a night on a town. And look at her parents here. They are absolutely gorgeous. I don't know if you can actually see this um, here. Or I can actually scroll down to page 176. Let's do that. Let's see how this works for us. Page 176. And I'm going to go right back up to our reading. Here we go. This is much better. Okay, look at parents out on a town here. Carla Lou and Juanita Walls there. And then remembering the prologue when Carly. Uh, Carlotta mentioned how her mom kind of modeled her style after um, the beautiful magazines Jet and Ebony with flowers in her hair. Mother wearing her trademark magnolia in her hair like Billie Holiday. And then here are her parents and Carlotta here. And of course, Carlotta as an eight-year-old. Uh, this is when she first experienced the sting of the white woman's words. Uh, on the bus incident, okay? Let's go back to page 49. But I wanted to point out, um, whenever she mentions a description, the imagery of people in her life, you can start looking at that on page 176. Okay, let's go back to page 49, everybody. We're still in chapter three called Birth of a Tiger, okay? Chapter three, page 49. I had to show you those pictures because I think they're very glamorous um, for the times in which... Um, what's happening in the South there, page 49. Where am I? I'm sorry, it's taking up so much time. Okay, here we go, page 49. Okay, next time I won't scroll all the way down there like that. Okay, so on page 49 here, 48. 49, okay, 48, we were here. So she was talking about how glamorous her parents were, and I just had to scroll all the way down to show you on page 176, because they really were, okay? She says, you could see it all over his face, especially when he stepped out with his glamorous wife on his arm. Page 48. That sense of style extended to our home. As my parents made changes here and there, our house took on a more open, modern look, inspired, I'm almost certain, by Mother's Mini Magazines. She had subscriptions to the most popular ones of the day, Look, The Saturday Evening Post, Life, and of course, Ebony and Sophia. The latter three were her favorites. Ebony and Sophia were uh, general interest publications, heavy with photos and uplifting stories, but they were Black-owned publications that focused primarily on Black success. They particularly showcased the glitz and glamour of the few Black movie stars and entertainers of the time. Mother was a huge fan of crooner, Billy Eckstein, and her Black magazines kept her in close touch with the likes of him, Nat King Cole, and the Lena Horns of the world. Mother had that kind of movie star presence about her too. 
One of her best friends, Tyra Lee, used to say mother into the room like Loretta Young. Young, a popular white actress, had her own television show back then. And when she entered the stage with the sweep of her flowing evening gown, Aunt Tara Lee would say, there goes Juanita. Mother's touch was noticeable everywhere that summer as she finished the transformation of our house. Out went the plastic covered sofas and chairs and in rolled more contemporary replacements. I spent many evenings curled up in the, the cup shaped white leather swivel chair in front of the television, a black and white model with the largest screen I ever seen. It was an RCA and it sat on a fancy black swivel table in the new den. For the expanded kitchen, my parents added a bar with red padded stools that each sat on a chrome base. When I plopped down many mornings of those bar stools with my piping hot grits and scrambled eggs, I felt as if I were in one of those California diners I'd seen on television. Sitting in front of the television had become one of my favorite pastimes. With no homework during summer, I could spend as much time as I wanted watching my favorite shows. Amos, I, I think I know this show. Amos and Andy, I Love Lucy, and Esther Williams in her swimming movies. I especially love Father Knows Best. Class, I even love I Love Lucy still. After watching the episode one day, I turned to mother and asked, may I call daddy father? She just laughed. She had long ago put an end to my calling her mama. She said it drove her crazy the way I dragged out the four letter word. Mother seemed more fitting, more elegant, but father never stuck, never felt quite right. There was an earthiness, a closeness, a kind of warmth to daddy. Daddy was a prankster who kept us all laughing, but he was wise too and very much the traditional head of our household. The truth be told, my home life wasn't much different from those of white families I saw depicted on screen every day in what became known as the golden age of television. I didn't see families that looked like my happy black families on TV, but we were a stable clan with two loving, doting parents. Daddy worked, mother primarily took care of the family's domestic needs, and we children got to be just children. I knew our lives weren't as perfect as those we saw on TV, but whatever problem problems my parents may have had, they did their best to keep them from my sisters and me. Our home was peaceful, full of laughter, and often full of extended family. Some of my favorite family times were spent in front of that black and white television, watching a broadcast of a Dodgers game. Very important, very important incident, or very clear about what Carlotta values most in her life, okay, class? You're always annotating for those two things. Details that shape Carlotta's story and incidences that played a role in shaping Carlotta's story are always so important, okay? Always want to remember that. She goes on to say, on those Saturdays, Mother, Daddy, and I would gather in the den with whatever relatives and friends had joined us, usually my uncles and their wives or girlfriends. I'd cook hamburgers while my sister Luana then ate, played with her dolls. All the while, the newest member of our family, my youngest sister, Tina, who was two at the time, ran from one family member's lap to the another. In previous summers, my love of baseball had extended to playtime. But for the first time since our neighborhood softball games began, the kids in the community didn't meet on our playing field in the summer of 1957. All of us, black and white, had practically grown up together on that field. Some of us were finally headed to high school. I wonder if any of the white kids among us would be going with me to Central, too. But I never got to ask them. I couldn't have imagined that 
we would never again come together on that field. Perhaps they were already feeling the tension. By then, community tensions over the school system plans to integrate Central had started bubbling to the surface, though I was still mostly oblivious to it. I kept busy with family, friends, and of all things, potato chip sales. In June and July each summer, I sold bags of potato chips to raise money for Y Team Camp a two-week program sponsored by the local YWCA. YWCA. Oh, this used to be called YMCA when I was younger. And I must say, I was pretty good at it. I hiked through the neighborhood, knocking on the doors with my chips in tow. I took the chips to church and, of course, to every family gathering, gathering until I made my sales commitment. Going to camp was a great sales motivator. I loved camp. It was two weeks of freedom with some really good friends. My best friend, Bunny, always joined me on the trip. Her real name is Dorothy Frazier, and we've been friends for as long as I can remember. Her grandmother lived just a block away from my house and across the street from White Memorial Methodist Church, which both of us attended. Bunny's father had died in World War II when she was a baby, and she lived with her mother and stepmother father who was a doctor. I also enjoy spending time at camp with another good friend, Jeanette Mazik, who lived about 45 miles away in Pine Bluff. Jeanette and I had met through our fathers who sometimes worked construction jobs together. Because we lived in different cities, we didn't get to see each other regularly until camp. Bunny, Jeanette, and I rode the bus with the other Y teens to camp in Clear Fort, Arkansas, just outside Hot Springs. I didn't realize then that it was the only site in our area that admitted black campers. It was a beautiful and serene, several acres of woods surrounding a sparkling lake. Rustic cabins set nestled among the woods. We rose early most mornings to hike, explore the woods, compete, against other cabins and games and participate in arts and crafts projects, such as making keychains and lariats. At night, we enjoyed cooking out and singing around an open campfire. I could hardly wait, but camp was at the end of July, still a few weeks away. In the meantime, I spent many of my days at the Dunbar Community Center, a city-run recreational spot that had become a sort of gathering place for Black people. Little Rock. It was a short bus ride from my house and something fun was always happening there. In the evenings and on the weekends, Black fraternities, sororities, and other groups regularly held meetings and adult parties in the center's huge hall on the main level. A smaller room upstairs drew families and churches, church groups for afternoon receptions, but during the day, the center belonged to the city's youth. It was always full of children and teens playing games and cards while the latest sounds of rock and roll blared from the jukebox. Chuck Berry, Little Richard, The Platters, Elvis Presley, Fats Domino, you name it. Occasionally, some of the popular artists passing through Little Rock play daytime gigs at the center. One afternoon, I made my way there to see the duo Mickey and Sylvia perform their latest hit, Love is Strange. I was headed in the door when I spotted Ernest Green, a friend and former Dunbar student. Ernie was two years older and about to enter his senior year at Horace Mann. His mother had been my first grade teacher. The two of us greeted each other, chatted for a moment, and then he asked, are you going to Central? Yep, I responded proudly. He told me that he had signed up too, but that none of his friends wanted to leave Mann in their senior year. One of them, Lottie Hawt, who would later become Lottie Shackelford, the first woman elected mayor of Little Rock had just achieved her long time goal of becoming editor of the bureaucrat, Beer, Bearcat, I'm sorry, the school newspaper. Ernie asked if I knew of anyone else who had signed up for Central, but I didn't. My friend Peggy, who lived two blocks from me, had told me she had no interest in going to Central. She was having too much fun at the new man. Ernie looked concerned. We need to contact a few people and see if they want to go with us, he said. We agreed and headed into the center. See you at Central. I said. A few weeks later, I stepped outside my home to meet the postman as usual and was surprised to find a letter 
for me from the Little Rock School District. I read it quickly and ran inside to show mother confirmation of my admittance to Central. She smiled approvingly and con congratulated me. That's the first time I remember any communication with her about my decision to go to Central. Even then, there was no big decision, but I could tell she was happy for me. The car instructed me to show up at Central on a certain date in August to register for fall classes. Now, I was getting excited. But just two days into August, misfortune struck my family. I was standing on a porch that day when mother stepped to the front door and called me inside. The distress on her face and her red eyes told me right away that something was wrong. Papa Holloway was gone, she said. Oh my goodness, class. Did I just read what I just think I read? Not Papa Holloway. I'm going to underline this. She said the distress on her face and her eyes told me right away that something was wrong. Papa Holloway was gone, she said. Our patriarch. Think about the um, paternal side of Carlotta's family tree. So Papa Holloway has to be Carlo's father. Our matriarch, the man who had raised her, protected her, and kept the ground beneath her steady in those early days after her mother left, was dead. This is Juanita's father. His oldest wife, Aunt Helen, had found him unconscious. His oldest son's wife. Aunt Helen had found him unconscious lying among the corn in his expensive garden. I heard mother say something about him hemorrhaging. I'd never heard that word before. I hugged her as she wept inconsolably. My heart ached too. Papa's death dulled the excitement I had felt in the days before. But as relatives chatted in our home after the funeral on August 7th, I heard mother tell some of some out of town relatives. You know, Carlotta will be going to Central in the fall. There was pride in her voice, which lifted my spirits. However, when word got out that I was going to Central, not everyone in my family agreed with my decision. I couldn't understand why Aunt or Aunt Eva the Dunbar librarian didn't seem particularly excited when I told her. That was unusual for her because she was such a high-spirited, fun-loving person. I learned through the family grapevine much later that she wanted my parents to withdraw me from Central and send me to Man. She didn't understand I heard why I needed to go to that school. Aunt Eva and all the other staff members at Dunbar were a proud bunch, and rightly so. They had given up their summers and holidays to add postgraduate degrees to their resumes. They had labored in a school system that still paid them less than a generally less educated white teacher. They had invested their skills and hearts in preparing Black children for a world that would require them to be twice as good and work twice as hard. And they have produced stellar students despite the discrepancies in resources. Those dedicated Black educators knew where their loyalties lay. But they weren't at all confident that their white colleagues at Central would be able to look past the skin color of Black students, see and nurture the future doctors, lawyers, scientists, and entrepreneurs we could become. So while the Dunbar staff may have understood and supported the justice of the Supreme Court decision in Brown, if they were a tad chilly to the practicality of it, their sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, being the first to go over to that school, they believed they had good reason. Nothing was ever quite so black and white. Of course, as stubbornly determined teenager, I couldn't fully understand why all of my relatives weren't just thrilled that I was preparing to attend one of the top high schools in America. Hadn't they always preached to me about the values of education? Hadn't they always encouraged me and shown by example that I 
should open myself to opportunities for advancement. So the concern and reluctance among a few of them to embrace my decision fully didn't sit too well with me back then. It smacked of hypocrisy. With maturity, I would come to understand the gray that sometimes sits between right and wrong. And I would come to under appreciate that their concern was more out of love than anything else. But at that time, I just turned, I just tuned them out. Thankfully, mother and daddy would not be influenced either. So as registration day grew closer, I called Gloria Ray, a classmate at Dunbar. We had taken typing together and were members of Honor Society. She was a serious student. She wanted to be an atomic scientist, for goodness sake. I suspected that if anyone else was considering Central, she was on the list. I was right. Gloria told me that she was indeed planning to attend and had received the same card about registration day. She agreed to pick me up. As planned, Gloria and I rode together to Central for the first time. We considered the day so routine that we went without our parents. Our parents were very protective and would have demanded to go alone if they had any inkling of trouble, particularly Gloria's father. Harvey Ray was much older than my parents and had already retired from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There, he'd founded the Arkansas Agricultural Extension Service for Inwards. He had received a degree in horticulture under Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute and worked as Washington's assistant. Her mother, Julia, worked as a sociologist for the state of Arkansas. Gloria's siblings and older brother and sister were already grown. Gloria was the baby of the family. She parked the car about a block away from Central and we made our way to the front of the school. It was a clear sunny day as we moved closer. I was filled with awe. I had never been this close to the front of Central before and the yellowish brick and white concrete building was even bigger and more elegant than I had imagined. As I stood ground level and stared up at that great entrance, I felt tiny. Concrete stairs flowed up from two sides and seemed to go on forever. The building seemed at least five stories high, and I wondered if there were elevators inside. Gloria and I climbed the steps, headed for the main entrance on the second floor. At the top, we passed beneath four white, life-size statues of Greek gods and goddesses. Each bore an inscription that seemed to carry a message about the place. Ambition, personality, opportunity, preparation. At first, when Gloria and I stepped into the school, we didn't know which way to go. The closed doors of the auditorium faced us just a few steps away, and signs pointed toward the main office to our left. We followed the signs to the office. We had barely made it inside the office door when a woman behind the counter quickly rose from her seat and approached us. I announced that we were there to register for the fall semester. She introduced herself as Miss Opie, the registrar. She smiled and handed each of us a card that said we had to attend a special meeting at Superintendent Blossom's office with our parents before we could register. Gloria and I looked at each other completely baffled. Miss Opie was firm, not the warm and fuzzy type, but pleasant enough as she explained that everything would be okay. The superintendent just needed to meet with us before the opening of school. None of the other administrative workers even looked our way. Gloria Gloria and I thanked her, then turned and walked back out of the office and down the steps headed for her car. The two of us weren't quite sure what to make of what had just happened. It was silly, we agreed, for school officials to instruct us to show up for registration, only to give us another car requiring us to attend another meeting. Why did we need to meet with the superintendent anyway? Why was it necessary to bring our parents and who else would be at the meeting? Gloria and I grumbled all the way to the car. As we got closer, we noticed a car parking just behind Gloria's car. An attractive, honey-colored woman wearing a dress and heels hopped out and began hailing us over to her. 
propelling us over. Like, come here. I recognized her right away. It was Daisy Bates, president of the Arkansas State Conference of NAACP branches. She and her husband, L.C. Bates, co-owned and operated the Arkansas State Press, the black newspaper I had delivered on my paper route in elementary and junior high school. Mother worked occasionally as an NAACP volunteer from a space at the newspaper Knife Street office where she sold memberships and collected poll taxes. Mrs. Bates and mother got along well. In some ways, they were cut from the same cloth, both pretty, ladylike Southern women who place great value in their manner and appearance. But where mother was soft-spoken and quiet, Mrs. Bates was outspoken and opinionated. Let's go here to our question here. Remember, you're highlighting for Carlotta, what is the significance of knowing Mr. and Mrs. Bates? And then I'm going to stop and pause right here, class. This is a very lengthy chapter, but I will be right back to do part two of chapter three, The Birth of a Tiger, right after Parent-Teacher Conference. Bye.